Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For this week's episode, I interviewed the head of Macmillan Podcast about how the book publisher is investing in the audio medium. More than a decade ago, before most people even knew what a podcast was, Macmillan, one of the largest book publishers in the world, launched a podcast network. Called Quick and Dirty Tips, the network consisted of short, scripted podcasts that delivered evergreen, practical advice on a range of topics from grammar to money management. In the years since, Macmillan has continued to invest in its podcast division, expanding into narrative shows and even teleplays. For this episode, I interviewed Kathy Doyle, Vice President of Podcasting, about where the company has seen the most success and how podcasting allowed it to diversify its revenue. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Kathy, thanks for joining us. Hello, Simon. It's great to be here again. Um, so you uh, run a, a Macmillan Podcast, which Macmillan is one of the largest publishers in the world. Uh, how long has po- po- their podcast ecosystem been around? Sure. So for us, we are actually comprised of two different podcast networks. And as you know, we've been podcasting for about 11 years. Our first network, Quick and Dirty Tips, was our joint venture with Grammar Girl Mignon Fogarty. And I was just looking at the data on that. We've actually surpassed 320 million lifetime downloads. So that's a pretty good number. And that network is comprised mostly of evergreen, nonfiction content. And I have to say, it's really exceeded our expectations in terms of having a long tail. That format just really works for us. And it's a phenomenal platform, really, for featuring nonfiction authors. And then then a couple years ago, oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. So a couple of years ago, we started a second network. So we could kind of, what we were finding was that we were finding talent that didn't quite fit the QDT model of being really short format, quick, actionable information you can use in your everyday life. And that's when we founded Macmillan Podcasts, which to date has produced 16 original podcasts. And we have uh, experimented in a variety of genres. We've done some fiction, true crime. We had a wonderful show about the political climate and relationships as they relate to that. Parenting, you know, all, all shows that we believe truly play very well into our strengths as a book publisher. So and I, I like think to say, just, too, that we were a podcast network before a podcast network was even a thing. I know. I was just going to say, I think it's amazing that not only are you one of the only large publishers that has a robust podcast network, but you guys started way before what we can now consider to be the current podcast boom. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to kind of break it down, so like you had this quick and dirty tip. So those were kind of mm-hmm. short podcasts that were, um, you know, evergreen content. Uh, and sometimes they were connected to book series that you were doing. So you mentioned Grammar Girl. So there's this one of your most popular podcasts is Grammar Girl, where it's like every single episode includes like grammatical tips that people can learn but then she also has a best-selling series that is published by Macmillan um under the grammar girl banner so they kind of act synergistically correct yeah and we've actually done that with a lot of our hosts Mm -hmm. and so how big is the network in terms of like how many people approximately work for it either full-time or part-time so I have a team of eight uh, supporting both networks. We have producers, marketing, ad ops, editorial. And then, of course, we have freelance a couple of freelance audio production people for the QDT shows and our hosts and authors. And so you guys have been traditionally monetized mainly through advertising, right? So you sell ads on the podcast side, um, but then you also publish like the scripts for the, at least for the quick and dirty tips part, you publish those scripts as articles uh, on a website uh, where that gets a lot of traffic. And then you can also sell programmatic display advertising on that, correct? That is all correct. Yeah, yeah. We have a really nice, well-rounded approach for the QDT model where we have live host-read ads. Uh, we can backfill with by stitching in you know, some back catalog ads over time. We also, as you note, have a really robust website that we redesigned about a year and a half ago that includes really prominent podcast players throughout, really does a great job of sort of surfacing. What we were finding over the years was that the audiences for the podcast and the website were very distinct. And oftentimes, you know, the podcast hosts do a great job of pushing people to the website for bonus content, for an editor's checklist, for example, for a recipe. But people on the website were not really seeing that there was a player front and center and that they had the option to listen to that content via audio, which is, as you know, 
becoming such a popular format for consuming information. So we redesigned and really put the player up front and center, which has helped sort of bring the two audiences together. And we do it strategically, too, by, like I said, placing content on the website um, or even bonus audio that the listeners can only get if they go there. And because it's evergreen content and it's very practical content, you guys do really well with Google, right? Because I, I land on Grammar Girl articles all the time. Whenever I'm writing, I'm writing an article. I need to I need to try to refresh my memory on some grammatical tip. I Google it. Usually, one of the first things comes that comes up is a Grammar Girl article. And a lot of your articles that appear on the site are kind of like that, where they're they're aimed at answering someone's question that they might be typing into Google. Well, that's just it. The content is so incredibly well suited for those quick searches. You know, how do I get red wine out of a white marble table? When do I know if it's the right uh, grammar decision to use affect versus effect? They're all really quick tips, if you will. So they are very well suited to both being in, in the snippets that you'll see on Google and some of the other organic search engines. And then also we do work really hard. I have to say it's not by accident. Uh, we work really hard. We have a content strategist, Karen Hertzberg, who's the editor of QDT. Um, we work with our hosts on a, you know, gosh, almost daily basis to just ensure that all the content we develop, you know, there's a lot of different ways you develop content for audio versus web. So we're, we're constantly balancing those two formats and trying to make the best possible decisions to yield the optimal results on both sides of that fence. So I wouldn't, so the, the, the quick and dirty tips podcast, they're not like Q and a podcast, like what we're doing here. They're actually scripted. Um, but I wouldn't also describe them as narrative podcasts. Like they're not trying to tell like, you know, one narrative arc story, like a, this, this American life or, or a radio lab or something like that. Um, but as you mentioned, you guys are branching out into new things. So you guys are going to are it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are kind of moving into this narrative podcast uh, category and you're kind of trying to synergistically work with some of your narrative nonfiction books to kind of uh, create podcast audio from that. Am, am I kind of getting that correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we have also looked at QDT in ways to keep some of those hosts who've been uh, producing those shows for a very long time to keep them interesting, you know, just for example. And there's a lot of synergy between the two networks. A perfect example, we just, Christy, who's here in the studio with me, is the producer of a new show called Knowing. It's a biography show that we just introduced this week. It is with New York Times culture reporter Dave Itzkoff, who wrote a wonderful book about Robin Williams, the definitive biography of Robin Williams called Robin. And together they have put together a an eight episode series that really examines the life and death of Robin Williams and, and largely relies on, you know, the flow and the information from the book and does a great job of taking that content and putting it into <clears throat> a storytelling or narrative format. But they've also interspersed it with some incredible new and fresh interviews. Um, so it's a great way to both promote the full book, to update the story, which by now is a couple of years old. And synergistically, the point I was trying to make was that we took that uh, Dave Itzkoff, who is just I incredible on audio and just a, a wealth of knowledge and just a really smart individual. We're fortunate to have him working with us on this. He was a guest on the Grammar Girl show this week talking about how to write a biography. So we, we've we become sort of masterful at taking our resources and our assets. And the team sits in, and plots this stuff out and very strategically finds ways to both surface authors on both networks and then just to provide really useful, interesting storytelling, if it's a show like Knowing or um, you know, quick and actionable information that, or and taking those authors and using them on the QDT platform to just really provide useful and relevant information on those various verticals. That's really interesting. So, the is it the author of the book is also the narrator of the the podcast, or is he just one of the people who are interviewed for the podcast? Uh, he is a main theme throughout the podcast. He's on every episode with Christy. Oh, okay, and. Um, so, but it's not the the podcast. It's that's just one season. Like there's going to be future seasons on other famous people, right? That's correct. This is season one. You know, as you know, having been in this space for a while and written and talked about it with other professionals, audience development is becoming quite a challenge. So one of the things we're trying to do is launch multiple seasons. Uh, Knowing is our biography show, and Robin Williams is season one. So we're currently working. I can't say anything yet, but we're working on seasons two and three. And is is do you feel like conversations like this are happening more and more at Macmillan where a book is coming out and you're thinking about it as maybe like a piece of intellectual property that 
could you know doesn't have to fit into this one little this one wedge of a book like how do we spin it off into you know a podcast or obviously audiobook or now they're because netflix and all these other streaming services are so hungry for ip like do you think that that you know book publishers are really trying to think more dynamically about how do how do they approach their ip i mean i would say that our team is not in this to exploit IP rights. Uh, mm-hmm. We are in this to just provide consumers and listeners, website users around, and readers around the world with exceptional talent, great experiences, and just to really, you know, do what we do best, which is is, is provide those kinds of services to, to people around the world. Um, I think the entertainment companies, you know, the Wondries, some of the other networks out there are probably more focused on IP exploitation than we are. And so you guys fit under the podcast division falls underneath the audiobook division. Is that correct? Yes, we all work for uh, our publisher, Mary Beth Roche. And so what is the potential there for collaborations for between podcasting and audiobooks? Uh, there was a project that you guys did a few years ago called Steal the Stars. Can you talk about how that had that appeared in multiple formats across different mediums? Sure. We absolutely loved the work we did on Steal the Stars. That was kind of a model for an audio-first initiative. We worked with a team called Gideon Media and their wonderful writer, Mac Rogers, whose name I'm sure you know from the podcast space. Um, They developed a full audio production. It had a 14-member cast, and it was launched. We launched it first in conjunction with Tor, our science fiction imprint, as a podcast. So we took those assets in the script, and one of Gideon's team members adapted it for a book that we produced in all formats. So we also did some other interesting things. We did some sold-out live events, like we had a um, after the season ended, we did a live event that was a prequel to the actual story of Steel of Stars, and it sold out, and it was super fun for rabid fans. We took those audio assets, and we used them as bonus content in the audio book once the season was over. So, um, And of course, that content, you know, the nice thing about doing um, a production like that is that content is also evergreen. And it really does continue to entertain listeners and it gets put oftentimes in national media hits on, you know, great audio dramas to listen to on your next car trip kinds of um, of, of listicles. So we continue to benefit from that. And that's one of the shows, too. You asked about monetization earlier that we are um, trying to rely on dynamic ad insertion, DAI to see if we can continue to, to drive some revenue for that show. And that's just really fascinating from kind of uh, the, you know, to go back to that word synergy and the, all the different ways you can monetize it. So just based on my counting, you could sell advertising on the podcast. Then you take the entire podcast and, and package it together. You sell it as an audio book, but then you also published a print book version of it. So you sell that. And then you also produce live events um, so that you could sell tickets to that, so you could monetize it four different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's a lot of work, but yeah. you know, it takes a lot of planning, and it takes great teamwork. Yeah, it's probably something you couldn't scale to doing like a hundred times a year or something like that. Right. <laughs> um, so I don't think anybody could do it a hundred. Not even Hernan Lopez could do it a hundred times a year. Yeah. So obviously, somebody who's or a company that's really been in the news lately as it re- relates to to podcast is Spotify. They've just acquired uh, a bunch of companies and they keep on signing exclusive deals. What are you guys doing with Spotify? So we have a really close relationship with Spotify as we do with all the major distributors. And I think we've worked really hard over the last decade to just be a great partner to all the platforms, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, etc. I think um, because of our longevity in the space and how competitive it is, we don't look to a partner like Spotify to just see what they can do for us to boost our listens and kind of our overall presence. But I think we really think about it in terms of how we can be a great partner. How can we sort of share our insights on the user experience and the back end dashboard where the data is available to us. And so we've been involved with, you know, all of our partners um, on all of those fronts. But in particular, you know, Spotify, we partnered with them. I actually went on LinkedIn and found out who was in the early days starting to run uh, podcast at Spotify back in like 2013 and sent a cold email. And lo and behold, they were literally on the same block that we were at the time in the Flatiron District. So we scheduled a meeting and we were on the beta platform um, as soon as they launched it. 
And we've done some really cool stuff together. Mm-hmm. And so Spotify is getting into testing these like these playlists, these commute playlists. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. So obviously Spotify is really well known for its music playlist, but now it's trying to do playlists where it kind of splices together music, but then it might be followed by a short podcast and then another song and then another short podcast. Are, are you guys participating in these playlists? Well, it's really interesting you should bring that up because one of the things we did with them before that iteration of playlists was we worked with our contacts there to kind of develop special curated collections of episodes. We didn't really call them playlists, but we would actually set up a podcast feed with sort of doing what we do best, which is curating the archives from the Quick and Dirty Tips Network to put together exclusive packages. We did one on an audio guide to happiness. Um, We did one for their younger audience on Life After College last spring. We did one on mindfulness. And it was a great collaborative effort where they promoted these playlists and we promoted the playlists. And it was a win-win for everyone because we could also, you know, put in this one single collection a variety of our hosts together in ways that really made sense for the listener. So if you were just out of college, you could find out, you know, from Grammar Girl, best tips for writing your resume. You could find out from our Get Fit Guy how to work out on a budget a nutrition diva, you know, had a meal plan in a small kitchen with a tiny budget. So it was, it, I just, I really think that really played to our strengths too as, as content curators. But you mentioned the fact that now Spotify has introduced these wonderful features, these playlists that allow users to develop sort of a mix of podcast episodes and music. And yes, we pounced on that immediately and we had a lot of fun. We um, collaborated as a team, got together with the hosts, and we've put together Um, In fact, I can give you some if you want to include them in the show notes, but we've put together a lot of really relevant playlists on topics like fitness. And of course, we've got a bunch of grammar ones and we've shared them with Spotify and we've talked about them on social and the hosts are sharing them in their episodes. So it's just it's a it's a great way for us to surface content in a whole new way on that platform. I saw news recently that some publishers are even kind of specifically creating podcasts that are specifically designed for those playlists like get like gimlet media has a show called science versus which is like 30 minutes <laughs> long answers some kind of scientific question on each episode where they distilled it down into 10 minute episodes specifically for the playlist have you have you guys been doing anything like that or are you guys kind of already your your podcasts are already kind of designed at the right length for the well, Simon, I'm a huge fan of Gimlet, and I did read that article, and my first thought was, gosh, we've been doing that for 10 years. <laughs> um, our, you know, our, our format just really works for that. And, you know, there, there's commuting playlists. There's all kinds of ways where we're seeing a surge in interest in short format content. And we have a, a rich and deep archive of over 6,000 episodes, and we're, we're working every angle we can to, to get it into listeners' hands. So I guess you're bullish on Spotify and its expansion into podcasts and this being the new frontier for them? Listen, we're bullish on anyone's expansion into podcasting. It's a good thing for all of us. And so, uh, you know, we also want to develop content too, where we try to, you know, we did some YA stuff on the Mac podcast side, um, I don't know, a little over a year ago, where you know, we're trying to also be a good partner in terms of helping the industry and helping the distributors bring new listeners into the space. And you mentioned like how hard it can, or it can be a little bit hard to set up advertisers for a narrative podcast, especially if it only has like one season, you see some of these one season narrative podcasts having a really hard time to get advertisers on board in time before the pot, the season completely ends. What do you think? And some people have theorized that platforms like Spotify that rely heavily on subscriptions and also there's Luminary, uh, which also uh, has exclusive podcasts behind a paywall. There's also Stitcher Premium. What do you think about these kind of uh, these kind of subscri- paid subscription podcast platforms being a better fit for really expensive narrative style podcasts that might be hard to monetize through advertising? Well, I will say that, you know, we have Michelle Margulis who handles our ad operations. It is a full time job. You know, it is a lot of manual labor, if you will, to ensure that when you have, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 weekly shows running and you've got live host read ads in hopefully all of them, which most of the time we do, um, it, it's a lot of work. You know, it's, it's a, I call it a giant game of telephone, right? Because it kind of starts with the product manager at the, at the consumer company. You know, if it's a Procter & Gamble, if it's a Talkspace, whoever the advertiser is, that product person has to go to their agency. That 
typically has to go through several iterations before they have you know a concept and a campaign that then has to come to in our in our case we're a stitcher midroll partner so that has to go to to that team um, to finesse it to make sure that they can you know get the ad buy together then it comes to us and to our ad operations team um, when Michelle has to take a lot of time out to you know proofread the script to make sure it's in the tone and the voice and the approach of the host so it sounds the way it is intended to sound, which is very genuine and believable and yields the right result, which is either a direct response by or you know a brand lift for a brand campaign. Uh, and then it has to go on to the host and she has to test all the links and check the promo code. And it, it, it's really quite a process. And so are you saying then that like it's in some cases it might be nice just to not have to worry about advertising at all and be able to, you know, sell a show to like just like a lot of places are trying to sell TV shows to Netflix and Hulu, yeah. like maybe that you could see some deal flow happening where you're selling shows to these exclusive um, podcast platforms? You know, I think for us, I'm really proud of the work our team does to make that uh, that process very seamless and to the extent possible flawless. One of the mid-roll reps told me recently that the, our shows are a safe haven for advertisers, and I think that's because we do a quality job and we take that role very seriously. It's, it's an integral part of what we do and the way we produce content. Uh, we want the quality of the ads to be as high as the quality of the shows. But I don't think everybody has that resource and or that mindset. You know, I think there's a lot of publishers out there who take a different approach to it, and that's just fine. Uh, they go straight to Megaphone or one of the other platforms where they can just do announcer-read brand campaigns. In a lot of cases, you know, there's so many journalists now who are hosts of podcasts, and it's just not appropriate for them to do live host-read ads. So it's a mixed bag, and I think it has to be handled very much on a case-by-case -case basis. We've done some limited windowing with, with Stitcher Premium because they're our partner. Um, we are not on Luminary. Um, you know, it's, I was listening a couple of days ago on the train to the new media show this week, and Todd Cochran did this bit where he literally ran the math to show how many millions of subscribers Luminary would have to have to kind of catch up with the amount of funding they've received. Um, I think it's a big challenge uh, trying to build a platform like that from scratch. Yeah, and they definitely had some stumbles. I think Spotify kind of has the right approach where it's being this all-in-one audio platform. So it, it has such a huge bundle and it already has like a huge head start with you know over 100 million paying users that it can create a lot of value with exclusive podcasts in a way that it would be hard for Luminary to do when it's starting completely from scratch. Um, so uh, LinkedIn has this platform called LinkedIn Learning. They I think they acquired it from another company. I forget what the company... Uh, Linda.com. Linda Linda um, and so yes. obviously co online courses are becoming kind of a booming business. You know, uh, I don't know if it's reached to become like a billion dollar industry yet, but uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of companies moving into this. You guys have started to repackage some of your podcasts and put them as LinkedIn learning courses. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's really been one of the 2019 highlights for us, I think. LinkedIn Learning approached us and, you know, sort of building on the strength of the brand and the books that you referenced earlier and the Grammar Girl podcasts, they wanted to build a writing course. And we really saw it as just, um, you know, another opportunity to the, all the points we've been talking about, about, you know, various ways we can monetize, various ways we can reach new audience. It was a way for us to do something new. And they're obviously a really bring part, very big partner. They bring a lot to the table in terms of their strong video expertise in particular. And that's really something that we don't do that much in. So we also were very attracted to the fact that, you know, their relationship with Linda, their huge membership, uh, premium membership, would mean that the course was effectively, to some extent, free for so many people. We just thought it was a, a terrific collaboration. So Mignon worked with them, um, and it really played to the strength, I think, of her core content, which is to focus on better writing. She's been doing this for a very long time, so a lot of her episodes now um, can vary in scope and in format. But this really just, you know, I've been talking a lot about playing to, to our strengths, but in this course in particular, uh, just it was handled so perfectly. They handled all the production. It's been performing really nicely to us. And it just gives us this incredible opportunity to extend Grammar Girl to a new audience of learners, you know, people who perhaps um, can grasp content about how to write better in an auditory fashion. It might be easier for them. And Mignon just felt like it was a really interesting way uh, for her to kind of distill down the best of what she's done in the podcast and everywhere else and just put it in one super accessible place. And of course, for me, uh, my hope too is that that extends 
uh, people who take the course are so enamored with her and the incredible content that she shares that we're able to then translate into into more website users and podcast listeners. So it's a win win for everyone. And can you can you purchase the course on an individual basis, or is it like some kind of is it like a subscription platform where you subscribe to get access to all their courses? You can buy it. You can buy it. I think um, I think they have different levels of of membership for both premium and for learning. So my final question is something that obviously a lot of people wonder about, and especially when you start talking about book publishers and podcasts. Do podcasts sell books? I mean, we certainly believe they do, or we wouldn't be doing this, don't we? <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, too, because book it's the same with book sales that it is with podcast listeners. You don't own the customer. And that's a really big challenge if you're a publisher. Um, but we have seen great evidence that you know, the podcast listeners are extremely engaged. You know, I've used in the past the example of our savvy psychologist. You know, we worked, uh, she's a host of one of our more popular shows on the QDT side. We worked for a while to uh, develop a newsletter to really build her platform out, uh, got her blogging gigs on other Psychology Today, Scientific American. Um, all of that led to a surge in her popularity. And over time, we worked with her to get a great book with St. Martin's Press on social anxiety. And what we saw there, because we knew so many of the people who bought the book were podcast listeners, was just a huge number of sales on the audio format. So we, we, we know it works. Are there like opportunities to take any unsold ad inventory and just fill it with ads for upcoming Macmillan books or anything like that? Sure. We do it all the time. Hmm. Interesting. Another way that we synergistically all work together, our imprints, our publishers, our podcast team, our audio team this week. So I checked it out. Okay, Kathy. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find your work online? Oh, quickanddirtytips.com and macmillanpodcast.com. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Simon. It's been great. Okay. That's all we have for you today. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Content on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. See you next week.